so yeah, so basically, um, so this is the last day of Black History Month. Well, the last day of February, um, which is um, us ending this particular month, but of course, um, Black History is celebrated throughout the whole year. Um, I am, I'm actually working towards becoming a social, socio cultural visual anthropologist. And um, we have um, an international community here at UV. So I wanted to kind of um, speak in regards to how and why Black history is celebrated around the world. So I wanted to kind of uh, start this with, um, with it being lighthearted. And um, um, many people don't know that we do celebrate Black history around the entire globe. So um, here's some information about that. Um, February is Black History Month in the US and Canada. Um, what a lot of people don't know is in many countries, um, yeah, it's celebrated as I just mentioned. Um, and there are days designated to celebrating um, the Afro-descendant populations in, in different countries. Um, I'll share, share with you a few of those now. Um, would it be okay to put up the slide? Um, my um, great technology person, Sophia, she loves, um, yeah, she knows about technology. <laughs> and, uh, I don't like working slides, <laughs> just speaking. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, two of the most important um, months in celebrating Black history is of course February in the US and Canada. Um, the US actually set precedent and inspire black history celebrations around the world. Um, who we have to thank for that actually is um, a man named Carter G. Woodson, um, who was an African-American historian and journalist. Um, next slide, please. So this is Carter G. Woodson, um, a great historian and journalist. Um, and in 1926, he actually created what was known as Negro History Week to celebrate the achievements of the African-American community. He chose the month of February to celebrate Frederick, um, Frederick Douglass, the groundbreaking abolitionist and former US uh, President Abraham Lincoln, uh, under whom slavery, slave, slavery was abolished um, in the US. Um, arguably, uh, Negro History Week was the precursor to Black History Month, and in 1970, the, the first Black History Month was celebrated at Kent State University in Ohio. Within a few years, it became a nationwide celebration and has inspired similar celebrations around the world, um, moving to Canada. So I think that's the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Or actually, no, it's not. Okay, we can go back to the other slide. Sorry about that. So um, yeah, so yeah, Canada and the US um, celebrate Black History Month in February. Actually, next slide will be great. Again, I'm sorry, back and forth. <laughs> okay, so basically this um, woman here, um, this is a fun fact, fact here. She was, um, this is, um, the first Black Canadian woman elected to the House of Commons in Canada. Her name is Jean Augustine. Um, she actually created Black History Month in Canada in 1995. Um, she was elected to parla 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 uh, Parliament, sorry, Parliament, um, and introduced a motion to celebrate Black History, which was passed by the House of Commons. Um, next, we have Germany, um, the country of Germany. Next slide, please. The country of Germany um, was the first um, to begin celebrating Black History Month in 1990 and founded by the members of the initiative Schwarzer Dusche, um, the initiative of Black Germans. Black History Month was founded in Germany as a cultural space for attendees to discuss, to discuss Black history and contributions of the, of the African diaspora more widely. Um, and then also for Italy, where uh, Black History Month is re relatively new, but thriving though, nonetheless. Um, in February, Black History um, celebrations are held across the country, um, including Rome, Milan, Bologna, um, and in particularly Florence. Black History Month in Florence was founded in 2016 recently, 
um, by African-American artists, Justin Randolph Thompson and musician Andre Halyard to highlight the cultures of African diaspor diasporic communities throughout Italy. Okay. And then let's see. And then, so yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, another popular month for Black History Month is October around the world. One of the first nations to celebrate in this month is in the UK. Um, Black History Month was founded in the UK by the pine, pioneering Ghanaian, Ghanaian analyst, journalist, and pan African activist Akiyaba Adai Sebo. Um, he chose the month October, October because it's near the beginning of the academic school year in the UK. So Black, so black British children can begin the academic year um, with a sense of pride. They will have that sense of pride before they start their studies for the year. Um, so yeah, we um, now travel to the Republic of Ireland where Black History celebrations began locally in 2010. Um, next slide, please. So the Republic of Ireland, where Black History celebrations began, um, began locally in 2010 before re being recognized in 2014. Um, let's see. October is celebrated in the Netherlands as Black Achievement Month. It was also created in 2015 by Dutch former politician John Lindem. We don't have a picture of him right now in the slides. In collaboration with the National Institute for the History of Slavery and Heritage, also known as NINSI. Um, countries hold, which hold Black History Month at different times of the year are Belgium and Australia. And I just have a picture here of the globe um, because um, I'm going to speak of just some other countries that have um, started or celebrate Black History Month um, and other days um, pertaining to Black history. Black History Month in Belgium is celebrated in the month of March. It was established in Antwerp in 2017 by members of the African Youth Organization by and Minata Dunal and Mohammed Berry. And now, and also in Australia, all the way down in Australia, Black History Month is celebrating, uh, celebrated in July. This celebration is distinct in that, it, in that it focuses on history and cultures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities. In this case, Black is spelled B-L-A-K. It is a term used by the Aboriginal people to reclaim agency over the notion of Black and Blackness. The month of July was chosen to coincide with the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander celebrations, NADOC Week, and the coming of the lights. And now, now let's switch things up a bit and shine a spotlight on countries which have specific days dedicated to, dedicated to celebrating the Afro-descending communities. Um, we kick things off with Venezuela, who hosts Afro-Venezuelan Day on May 10th, which begins in 1995, made official by Venezuelan National Assembly, chosen to commemorate um, the date in 1795 when Jose Chirino, a free Black man in Venezuela during the slavery um, era, led an uprising against Spanish colonial rule. Less than two weeks later, Colombia followed suit with Afro-Colombian um, uh, day held on May 21st, celebrated in 2001. Uh, Afro-Colombian Day is an annual comm commemoration of the abolition of slavery in, Col in Colombia. Um, actually, um, actually, in Panama, they celebrate um, Black Ethnicity Day, which pays homage to Panamanians, African Antillian, and African heritage communities. And this date recognizes when the Spanish, Spanish king Ferdinand VII banned the importation of enslaved Africans uh, to some of its colonies. Okay, let's see here. So yeah, um, let's see, Peru, um, where Afro-Peruvian culture Peru, Peru, which is one of my favorite favorite countries, um, and I love the culture. Um, it's where Afro-Peruvian culture is hosted on June 4th, um, together with, um, it was founded actually together with the sister, um, let's see, not the sister, but 
The person, um, let's see, his name is uh, activist Nico Mendez Santa Cruz, and he um, established this day with his sister, Victoria Santa Cruz. They pioneered the revival of the civil rights movement in Peru in the 1950s and 60s. Um, Black history is also celebrated in Costa Rica, Ecuador, Argentina, Belize, Brazil, um, and Brazil, which has one of the largest African diaspora communities in the entire world, which has over 100 million people of African descent there. And they have celebrated Black Consciousness Day and celebration of emancipation since the 1960s. So um, yeah, that was that's a little bit of the history of Black history around the world. So now going back to our American history, um, Black people, of course, I don't want to get too much into the, the um, brutal aspects of um, American history, um, but there has been some history of very brutal history, but then Black History Month is basically based on showing the accomplishments of Black people um, in this country and around the world and some of our recent ac accomplishments, as you all know, um, we did have the first Black president, um, Barack Obama, and then now we have the first Black and um, Asian um, vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, which is wonderful. And right here I have, um, I put here, Black history, live it, learn it, make it, 365 days a year. And hopefully we'll have some other um, Black history cultural days where we can get more into um, telling the community more about Black history and history of other cultures. And um, I'm, just, just, um, I'm just happy to celebrate Black History Month this month and to give out this information. So yeah, and we can have a Q&A later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all for um, listening to the presentation. Thank you so much, Star. And this is indeed uh, very much important how the entire world has is celebrating. And thank you for putting this together for us. And like ever since we came to America, I was only introduced when we came here and like learned more about it. But I'm sure we've all learned so many things, and this is an ongoing process. We are all part of this education. I would like to see if anyone wants to ask a question or share a point at this time. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Star. And it was wonderful. We loved your presentation and thank you for sharing your perspective um, on this topic. So our next speaker is um, Dominique Moye. Dominique, if you can come Hi. and Thank yeah. You. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. I was just going to share like this was such amazing information that Star just let us know about. I had no idea about the rich history and where other countries are, are um, recognizing the, the, you know, our history as Black people. So it's awesome. Um, I want to share my screen. Do I have access to do that, Sophia? I'll quickly make you a co-host, I think. And Perfect. All right. Well, happy Sunday, everyone. Happy, happy Sunday. Thank you for taking time um, on your Sunday, a day of rest, to um, just listen to information on this last day of Black History Month. I'm so happy to be here. I was actually invited by Star Edwards. I'm so excited. Um, a little bit about me. I'll jump into that as I go into the presentation today about who I am but I am a proud alumni of UCLA. So any opportunity I can to come back, just talk to fellow Bruins, I'm, I'm excited to do it. Um, all right, so I'm gonna be talking about today with you all, mental health and building community care. <coughs> so what that means, you know, we hear about mental health, but I want to, for the purposes of you all being in a community, um, you know, you all are a part of, you know, you're all a member of contributing to this community. Um, everyone's going to school. We all, you guys are all in a family um, community. So we're going to talk about what that looks like in terms of building that community care. 
So um, a little bit about me before we get into the presentation. Um, I'm a proud first generation college student. I always start with this um, as my starting piece because within that identity for me as a first generation college student, um, it came with a lot of mistakes that I made, a lot of mishaps, but also a lot of resources that were put into me by educators um, who showed me the way and showed me how to navigate education because I, I had no idea. Uh, within that time frame, while I was trying to navigate education, wellness was also something I was grappling with. What does that look like for me? Not really knowing what wellness was and when I was starting to become burnt out. So my educational history started off uh, at UCLA. I, well, it started off at the community college. Um, I then transferred to UCLA where I graduated in 2015 with a BA in sociology, minoring in education. I then, uh, within that space, while I was at UCLA, I knew I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to help people like so many educators and other community members help me to get to where I am today. So I knew, you know what, in order for me to do that, I'm gonna connect, I'm gonna connect my love for education and helping people. So I naturally, I pursued a master's of education degree in educational counseling, where I was able to pursue a career as an academic advisor, which I currently am right now. Um, I'll tell you a little bit. So you'll start to see the pattern for me and my, my trajectory was all about helping people. Currently, uh, within the space of being an academic advisor at USC, I realized there was a missing piece. People don't just want to learn how to connect the dots on their education. They also had, uh, there was a gap in understanding their own mental health. Um, how do you know when you're feeling burned out? When do you realize that you're going through depression? And that's what I was seeing within my students, especially right now in a pandemic. I'm sure you all have felt a uh, roller coaster of emotions as I have, especially during 2020, um, up and down emotions. Um, and so that's what I realized. So that's what led me to per pursue currently a master's right now in uh, marriage and family therapy. Um, and the hope is that I can go to underserved communities and be able to be able to open the doors of realizing that mental health is not, it shouldn't be stigmatized and it should be something that we talk about. Um, and it's very liberating when we talk about mental health. Um, and then another fun fact, I'm also a life coach. So I specialize in mindset life coaching um, and I support women with leveling up not only in their personal life, but also their career life. Um, and this is something that I just recently um, pursued during this pandemic. So that is just a little bit of who I am. Um, and now let's jump into what we're going to be talking about. So in the mental health space, I'm sure you all have heard of wellness and self-care. We all hear these buzzwords, right? We hear wellness, we hear self-care. And um, it's, it's like you, if you don't really understand it, it just, it, it may, you may not understand, you may not resonate with what it really means. So I want to dive into this a little more. Um, but before we do that, I love uh, James Baldwin. He's a famous author, African-American author. And um, he says here, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So that leads us into defining what wellness is. What is it? So wellness is a noun and it's the, uh, the definition is the quality or state of being healthy in body and mind, especially as the result of deliberate effort. The second definition is, it's an approach to healthcare that emphasizes preventing illness and prolonging life as opposed to emphasizing treating diseases. So as we see here, some themes that I'm seeing when I see the definition here is that it's show, wellness is really describing a high quality of life that we're all trying to achieve, right? We're trying to engage in certain practices that's gonna add some years to our life or we're not um, having health effects from bad uh, wellness. And that leads me to self-care. So self-care is defined as the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health. 
And the second definition is, it's the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness, in particular during periods of stress. So again, this is highlighting, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of engaging in a certain activity, especially when things are a little crazy, going, like there's a lot going on in your life. You, this is how you would tap into it. You're tapping into that care for yourself. But I want to, I want us to, so you guys, so I've, I've, I presented you all with uh, what def wellness is and what self-care is, but I want you to pay close attention to this next slide. So this was a viral post um, posted last year in March 24th by um, Nikita Valerio. And she says, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. I want to repeat that again for you all. Shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we are failing people. So everyone's like, whoa, no one has thought about this. I mean, we all say, get, get your self-care. You should engage in self-care. That's what you should be doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But this post kind of pushes back on this idea of the value of just self-care. When some people, it's, it may be dismissing other issues that are going on that will, that kind of prevents certain individuals from engaging in self-care because let's let's be real guys um self-care is a privilege some of us don't have time to stop some of us are parents some of us are working nine to five and plus another job when are you able to engage in self-care when self-care is not available to you so this kind of pushes back on that so this leads me to what is community care though what is community care? So community care is defined as a group of people like an extended family who commits to supporting each other, is accountable to care for one another, holds space for each other, and creates area for community healing. So this is a lot different from this idea of this individualistic pursuit of you just achieving your own self-care. This is talking about how can you come together in like a familial way and really support one another and keep each other accountable. So what does this look like? What does community care look like? What is, these are just words, but what would this look like in a day-to-day -day example? So this would look like reaching out to someone to ask for help. If, you know, not suffering in silence, feeling comfortable to call someone and say, I need help. Picking up coffee or lunch for a colleague while you're out or a neighbor, you know, while you're out. Showing compassion, not judgment for others. Not, not just, no, no judgment, right? We are all entitled to our feeling and what we're, what, how we're experiencing the world. And then lastly, asking the question, how can I support you in your work? How can I support you? These are simple, these are simple examples and the list can go on and on, but it's simply not just thinking about yourself, but it's thinking about how can I show up for my neighbor? How can I make sure that they're okay? And then they're, they're not suffering in silence. So this is, these are just the idea of community. I want you all to just marinate on how you can be engaging in community care, not just self-care. So again, reflect on how you can contribute to engaging in community care with your fellow neighbors. What does that look like? I know that most of you all are um, parents, you know, juggling a lot of responsibilities. Maybe you're in PhD, doctoral programs, master's programs. I, you know, it's tough, but it could be as simple as, let me just check in on my neighbor. Hey, are you good? Need anything? Is everything okay? just a simple check-in. So I'll leave you all with this quote by Coretta Scott King, the wife of Martin Luther King. She so eloquently said, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. So 
I want you to resonate with that and be intentional as you walk through your, your residential space and think about how you can engage in community care. Thank you. All right. Uh, to try to. All right, so that concludes my, let me stop sharing. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much, Dominique. It was powerful. I I loved all of your, all the definitions that you started from going from self and then going outwardly towards the community. It was really helpful. And, and we started thinking about how much we care about ourselves, but then how much care we can put towards our community. And then that community care comes back to us. So it's like an extended self-care. I love that. I want to know if anybody wants to talk a little bit or share something that we can all benefit from. Yeah, I found it, oh, Dominique, I, I really appreciate your presentation. And I found it so interesting when you put up the definitions of wellness on um, the fact that it's a, it's a noun, but so much of it feels like a verb. <laughs> like so much of it feels like it, it's like it's what you do and it's how you actively work towards it I took so many like just different notes as you were talking because I'm just like this is it hits home and it's it's just so interesting I also love language so like when you put different words out there and you throw and tag the definition with it um I always find myself especially in this arena kind of pondering on well, what does that mean when it's when it's cast out to beyond myself into an entire group of people into a community? Um, so I just wanted to get off mic and just express appreciation for what you shared. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I actually want to uh, say thank you for yeah. the thank you for the presentation as well. It was really good, and um, I just want to I mean I just want to even thank people that's on this call for the community for helping me with community care within the U university village community. Um, you know, with things that I when I've needed to have that 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 community that extended family. So, you know, people from Res Life, you know, have called to check in on me with me being a single mother and Alex, um, the treasurer that's on here of um, UASRA. I mean, he's checked in with me and and have helped me with mindful meditations when I was, you know, going through some anxiety, you know, and things like that. So um, I just want, and Sophia, she's always been there and 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 lifting me up and and um and vice versa, you know, and my friend Dominique. And so yeah, I just I just thank you guys for it's interesting that Dominique just spoke of extended community. I just really thank you all for being my extended community. I mean, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you guys. Thank you, Star. Uh, I was so <laughs> emotional and touched with the with the community reception that we see around each other and how we are all supported by each other. So I would invite Brittany, our last speaker for the day, and she's the community director over here working for the Res Life office. Brittany, we would love to have you now. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. No, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and happy Sunday. And just thank you so much for taking your time out to just be among and in this space um, on a Sunday. Honestly, it's just great. So I'll reiterate what Star has said. I honestly just love being able to see your faces. And Sophia, thank you so much for reaching out um, with the invitation to be able to, to talk. Um, and to honestly meet everybody where they are <laughs> so that we can talk about uh, what it means to be inclusive um, and how we can aim for a, mo a more inclusive environment, whether it be the one that you're currently in or future environments that you become a part of and that you join. What does that mean to be inclusive? Um, just a little bit, I don't have like, I don't have um, any visuals or a background. Honestly, I've been, I've been working in student affairs for almost 10 years now. 
I think I think I just look young, um, but almost 10 years um, and being able uh, to be privileged enough to have these conversations and to be in um, different spaces where we are tackling what it means to be inclusive. I wanted to come to you all today um, to kind of create an intimate space because I've learned over the years that uh, to have a conversation about inclusion is to have a pretty intimate conversation. Um, if I, I don't really want to stay on the surface level with you all um, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, which are often paired together, right? Um, I think we, we can hear it everywhere that we go, like diversity, diversity, this commitment to diversity and what does that actually mean? And what does that look like? Um, I do, I look at diversity as um, uh, somewhat measurable, right? Like uh, usually whenever we talk about it, we pull out like statistics and numbers and, and this is how we show the picture of diversity. Um, and when I think about inclusion, I think so much deeper than that and what it actually means to be inclusive. Um, uh, for myself, I look at inclusion as how we operationalize our commitment to diversity. How do we operationalize this understanding of differences um, and, and the push for understanding differences? And I think that what can be really complicated and really difficult is to, you know, we say, well, we need to be inclusive. You need to consider other people. Okay, well, what do I have to do? What do I have to learn? And all of that can push you to these outside resources. And some of the, the most intimate work that we do when it comes to inclusion is within. Um, I think that so much of our inclusion is what it means to start self-work um, and understanding and, and, and putting that commitment towards, you know, I, these are areas that I need to learn a little bit more about in order to understand and to, in order to be able to support. So I do think that inclusion starts with being honest with self, being forgiving with self, um, and really looking inward to say, you know what, I, I might not know much about this particular culture or this particular disability or um, this particular background, but let me be honest enough with myself first <laughs> to say that's where I'm starting as my starting point. And what do I need to do moving forward to be committed to what it means to be inclusive, um, to be committed to um, ensuring that people around me feel as comfortable as I feel in certain situations and or empathizing at a point where, you know, I can empathize with not feeling heard or um, that I belong or considered at all. And, and I don't want that to happen to others. So what do I need to do in order to be a part of this? Um, and so I do, I, I want to tag a little bit more on, Sophia, I know you mentioned this being a lot more interactive. And so I do want to pose a question to you all. Um, and if you feel vulnerable enough, feel free to go off mic. Um, but reflecting on a time where you have felt considered um, or heard or that you mattered or that you belonged, is there, um, I'll give us a couple of minutes, but any particular moment or time where you felt those feelings that I just mentioned? Star, you want to go? I, I thought maybe I see you. <laughs> oh, you see ready me. to speak? Uh, I'm writing, yeah, I'm writing this down with um some notes of Brittany's um saying right now. Um, so I would say just recently, I mean, just some of the things that I've gone through with dealing with this pandemic right now, and just being a mom, you know, a mom during the pandemic, and with me reaching out to my extended community, I, I finally, like in my life, felt heard and felt recognized. And, you know, like people wanted to be there for, for me because they really saw me struggling. Um, and it felt so good. And I, and I, I mean, it's amazing to see that there are people out there that have empathy, you know, true empathy and want to reach out and help. And even though they're going through their own things, you know, they have taken time out to help, you know, help, uh, they reach out to help me and help other people. So it's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Star. Uh, I, would, I would see if anybody else wants to share. I'll share. Um, I would say, I'm just thinking back on my educational journey and 
I felt seen and I felt heard when I could say something to like a, a goal that I had to a professor and like, or a counselor and they would bring it up and they would say, how's that going? Like, what's, you know, like really taking like interest in what my desires are, like what my goals are, not just seeing me as a number. Um, I think that was, that was really cool to, yeah, it made me feel a part of the space. Thank you, Dominique, for sharing. I could share. Um, so a recent time where I felt that way was um, in an individual supervision session. So I'm currently an MSW student and I was meeting with my supervisor and I was expressing some concerns and feelings, you know, using supervision, supervision to my best um, ability. And she just said straight out, like, it's okay to speak up. It's okay to not feel like things are okay. Um, and it's okay for you to, like, you shouldn't suffer in silence. And that to me, like, it's really, really stuck with me because a lot of times, like, you know, we feel like, oh, well, everybody else is going through stuff. Like, why do I want to go put my things on someone else? Um, don't want to be like that quote unquote burden. Um, but yeah, that moment I was just like, oh my God, it's okay for me to speak up. It's okay for me to not feel comfortable with things and, and to say something about it. Thank you so much, Arundra. Plus, thank you for sharing with us. Um, see if there's nobody else um, sharing. I would really want to share, <clears throat> um, like in recent times, how I felt um, this compassion and then receptive nature extended towards me, and especially in the U.S. community, U.S. Army officers, and like they've been like a family, and I've been working here for three years now and when I see familiar faces and I hear their kind words and they appreciate that I'm reaching out towards the community. Alex, Star, I'm so thankful to you guys and also other officers at USRA and Res Life and our neighbors who have taken time. They even write me a message or an email or if we are, I'm walking by and they just stop and say thank you for doing this. Thank you for making this effort and I feel so blessed and thankful that I'm going in the right direction. So it makes me feel that what I do, it matters and that I'm heard, that I'm seen, I'm not invisible. Thank you. I can share too. Uh, yeah, at work. Um, yeah, I'm working at an elementary school as an instructional assistant, and um, the first few years were horrible <laughs> because because uh, nobody there was appreciating the things I was doing there. But then suddenly we got a new vice principal, and he recognized my work, and you know he started to say supportive things, and he also changed the culture in the whole school. So now the whole admin team is appreciating me. You know, like he is. So yeah, I'm very grateful uh, for him being there. And now I really enjoy my time in the school. So there you go. Thank you all so much. And and it wouldn't be a question if I didn't answer it myself, right? <laughs> so a moment where where I have felt um, included, very very similar um, to you, Dominique, in, in terms of in the academic environment. There were there are many many moments where it where I felt like um, my experience and my voice or none of that was welcome at the table, but there are a handful of moments that I hold on to near and dear um, from being able to work really closely with past advisors and past um, supervisors. Very small handful of past supervisors who seem to really really consider um, and have a genuine desire to understand me. Um, understanding that for them, that would be the foundation of our relationship, whether that be academic or professional, but understanding how much of my story would be um, pretty much pivotal to uh, our ability to build a relationship. Um, and it's because those opportunities were so few and far between 
to actually get them was like, ha, huh, like I would hold on to those moments um, and will always hold on to those moments because if, if I was able to feel that way um, based on the actions of somebody else who considered me, I would like for other people to feel that way as well. Being dedicated to work um, with other people um, and honestly to maximize the best out of other people, I think it starts with um, that relationship and it, that, that uh, starting point of care. And so honestly, while you were all talking and, and sharing your stories, I was just writing down a couple of notes um, into what seemingly prompt this feeling of inclusion, um, of feeling heard and considered. And I just heard some themes of somebody creating that space of validating, of, of literal consideration, and of that selfless act, um, knowing that the rewards in return, like you're not accepting, you're not really expecting uh, these uh, grandiose rewards, or this has to show up in 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 some material way, but it may just show up in and deep self work and deep education, um, and so that just kind of brings me right back to when it comes to our own community, when it comes to inclusion, so much of that work starts with individuals and with with folks themselves, um, with prompting that idea, that consideration, and that conversation with other folks around you, with your neighbors. You've all seemingly been able to, to develop communities around you. And whether that took some months or a couple of years, you were able to create that community and to develop this community here um, in some way, whether that be with your neighbors um, who have eventually become friends. How did those relationships start? Um, who triggered that conversation and how did they grow deeper into learning about each other and kind of creating that organic relationship. I think that is the starting point of inclusion is including someone <laughs> into the conversation. It's, it's saying hi when, when you walk by or acknowledging a simple presence of someone that can make them feel like they are seen at the very least. Um, we'll work towards heard, but <laughs> if you um, are in, a, in community with someone and can't acknowledge their presence, then that in and of itself, you know, is going backwards from inclusion. So what are the small steps day to day that we can take in small interactions to make folks around us feel included, um, to show a genuine interest and to build that relationship from the start? I, I would never recommend walking up to somebody and being like, come here. Tell me everything that, you, that you've gone through so I can just be there for you. No, um, just like we talk about plants and what it means to grow, um, really being invested in the folks that are around you. And um, when you see them, how, are, how, did, how is your day going? How are you doing? When you see things that are happening out in the world, being able to consider who's in my circle or who's around me. If I'm seeing that there's, that there's just massive heartbreak in a, a different part of the world. And I know that that part of the world lives here in my own community. What are things that I should consider or that I could consider? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're taking um, actionable steps in your day to day, but that's why I emphasize that inclusion is so intimate and it's, it can be so internal. We all have a different kind of role in this um, journey towards really being a more inclusive environment. And for some that is deeply internal, for others that is right there on the front line. Find your place, find your role where you're comfortable so that you can learn and grow and build those relationships. I think that that is a beautiful starting place for inclusion. Um, and honestly, a beautiful, um, to go off of uh, Sophia's amazing artwork painting of what it means and <laughs> where we could start um, in terms of showing the picture of a more inclusive community and a community that cares for each other. Um, community care. I <laughs> will go take it back and, and, and wheel it back to Dominique's presentation. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions or um, thoughts that you wanna share about creating a community of care and or being more inclusive in our own community? I love how you mentioned, Brittany, about um, this idea of inclusion being very intimate. It's mm -hmm. something you really have to be intentional about. Um, I didn't really think about it like that, um, but it, it, it does take like one conversation just to reach out and just say, hey, I see you without saying that, but just mm -hmm. how are you doing? 
how are you? Like I just being in front of someone and have engaging in a conversation on an individual level, like that is inclusion, not just this overall like thought. It's sometimes very vague. And, and like you mentioned, we hear it in education all the time, being inclusive, inclusive spaces, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And let's be honest, for people of color, more often than not, they don't leave those spaces feeling included. So I love the idea of it being intimate, being intentional. Thank you. Let's see if someone wants to add to it. And um, we're here. Um, thank you, Brittany, um, for sharing these points with us. And it's very important that we evaluate every step, every thought that we um, gather on a day-to-day -day life to and like really start thinking from within, like, are we ready to extend that invitation? And like, when we start thinking outside ourselves as what Dominique had pointed, it's, although it can be just to the next individual person next to us, but it goes on into the community care and also starts the, concept of inclusivity. So I had a few thoughts and a few questions and I would still give time to anybody else who wants to ask questions, please feel free um, to unmute yourself. Was thinking, what if our community members and our, rest, our neighbors here start, like they feel hurt, they feel hurt by some instances, especially if people of color, they feel hurt. Like how do we begin to answer those like as neighbors. So we know we are required to direct them towards res life, but how can we start the process of showing them that we care and we are here for you? I, I do think that it starts with, I think it starts with spaces like these. Um, and with acknowledgement at the very least. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of on, um, I wanna be mindful of like, you know, being a part of like UASOA or residential life to give you access to like resources to be able to create spaces like this. So um, if you are able to, um, I know that you can go through UASRA if you wanna um, host your own programs and stuff. Um, so you can create this space as a, a community member, but, um, uh, on that level, creating that space and that acknowledgement that I let me know that this exists. I think that what's really difficult is um, we get into this role or this um, uh, pattern in our day to day of like, okay, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. And then we take in all of this news and we take in everything that's happening, but we keep going. Um, there, unless we're prompted to stop um, and to think and to consider. What is, what is it that we're going through? What is this that we're feeling? And who else is feeling this? So be able to create, being able to create that space, I think at the very least is acknowledgement of today is maybe easy for me, but it's probably more difficult for my neighbors considering everything that's going on. So if I create this space, if I at least acknowledge that something is going on, then we're not just kind of um, uh, feeding into this kind of silence of complicity and you just kind of keep going worker bee <laughs> um, mentality. Um, but I think on an individual level, it's, it does start with those relationships. So it, it sounds crazy, but I, I often reflect on my own experiences where, you know, things in my community are not well. I am hurting on the inside. My community is hurting on the inside and I have to go through day to day and just tap, tap, tap on those keys and, and act like everything is okay. But day to day, when I get those acknowledgements from other people, when I get that acknowledgement from my neighbor, very, very minimal words, but I do think silence does speak volumes. When you are able to acknowledge and to say, hi, how are you? Or just acknowledge and say, hi, acknowledging presence, sometimes it sounds so little, but it's like the nooks and crannies of, of like where we, where we start this pain is, is that it's never really acknowledged. Presence isn't acknowledged. Um, the experience isn't acknowledged. So starting that conversation with your neighbors of hi, hi, 
how are you? Or just showing that you're, you, you see them and that they could speak volumes. If you, if you don't feel like you can go into that deeper level in that moment, you don't have that established relationship with someone, but you want them to know that you care um, and that you, you know what's going on. I think that simple acknowledgement is a good start. Thank you so much, uh, Brittany. Thank you for sharing that with us. I have something to say. Yes. So I think another way that communities, um, like certain people who are, I would say marginalized communities are heard is by having like their own, their own spaces. Marginalized communities can have their own spaces where they, where they we um, come together um, and kind of just have a, um, safe space with one another and then having that middleman that's a network person to be able to go out and um, will obtain that information and go out to like what Brittany does, you know, um, some of the other, you know, leaders in the community and other communities be able to go out and give that information to the, I guess the, um, more of the, the leaders, the other leaders within the community. So they'll be able to go back um, and be able to help those, help the, like, people who are in need, um, how can I say it? Be able to be aware of what the needs are by having that person in the, in the safe space that are connected to the, uh, the outside communities. I shouldn't say outside communities. How, I'm trying to see how I can put this. Yeah, having that network person be able to go into the marginalized, you know, community safe spaces and to be able to, to be able to go out and get, be able to get those resources. Um, and information for to bring back to the people who need, you know, um, who are in need. And then as far as what Brittany um, has said too, um, it was something that you had asked one of your last questions where I was going to say that it is good to be able to be aware. I remember you were saying something about something about being aware of what your environment is or your spaces and people that are in that space. And I guess just to have empathy. I mean, this empathy is like a big word that's being popped up in society right now because it seems like certain aspects of society are is lacking empathy and other people are trying to teach empathy. Um, so just being aware of your environments and seeing and just having a heart for people, um, learning to have a heart for people, for people who don't have, I guess, don't have a heart for people, just being aware of people. Um, and seeing people as people, you know, filling people out. Um, and then also on the other end, people um, building, trying to build space, uh, relationships within their spaces. Um, and I think um, Brittany had mentioned something like that, like you're taking your time to kind of build those relationships as well. So, um, and then you'll have that, eventually have that opening um, to be able to speak to, you know, people more and give out more information about what your needs are and what someone else's needs are. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Star. Thank you for sharing that. And it was lovely to have you all uh, today and speak heart to heart. And I'm glad that we decided to record this because many of our neighbors, we understand that um, it's a Sunday morning. It's very difficult to wrap up the entire week. This is the only time they get as a break. Although many people had signed up and were interested, I'm glad that we made a recording. I'll send it and share it with them. And just before we leave, I also wanted to have a sh screen share on my end and I wanted to show something with you all. So... This is the activity that we did last week and I want to acknowledge everybody who came and participated and who also signed up to receive the craft material. So this was an activity we did to acknowledge and that we are all here together and that we believe in love, in healing, hope, equity, and building community and also justice. And it's both inwardly and outwardly. And the lantern that we see here signifies our hope. And the light also shows that 
And the colorful um, paper streamer you see here, it shows the time of hope and the black and white streamer just on the front of the bottle here shows the time of the night time and the daytime. And the time of hope is everything in between. And the last painting I want to share is, um, I've taught Liz as We Connect and I made it last year. And because we've all been talking about being connected and I thought this would be a good painting <laughs> to share with all you, all of you. And not to put myself in limelight, but to really show that this painting I made when I really felt that I was a little bit down, but I also saw this hope of people that I love, my family and friends and the community here. So I'm hoping that we all stay connected and reaching to each other and sometimes conveying our silence, sometimes using our words, but always connected. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Oh, Sophia. Oh, Sophia. Yes. My um, I forgot to tell my I forgot to give my cousin a Zoom link earlier, so she just joined. So she's at the end here. Just wanted to acknowledge my cousin. Oh, <laughs> my cousin Robin. <laughs> hi, hi, Robin. Hi, Robin. <laughs> hi. Yeah. Hi. So. Yeah. yeah. We'll be happy to share the recording, and it's. I'm happy that you were able to join us. And next time, we'll try and remind everybody and share the links before in time. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you all. Nice seeing everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy Sunday.